We've been talking off and on about revival. I told you I was going to take a break from <clears throat> the um, teaching about child child rearing, not child bearing, amen, child rearing. I know nothing about child bearing other than what I've watched, but child rearing. But I wanted to, to preach, and I think this song, I mean, this sermon would be uh, along the lines of revival. And uh, I told you I wanted to pose the question with the sermon, what makes you happy? What makes you satisfied? And um, I want to give you some background, if you will, to where I'm headed with this. And so it sounds crazy, but turn to Exodus 20, but I'm going to preach in Exodus 33, and we're going to read several scriptures in between those two points, okay? Um, <clears throat> I believe this is what the Lord had me preach but I never could get what I would call the piece to type out. So I have no type notes. I only have what I've been meditating on all week. And uh, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. And you know that in Exodus chapter 20, we have the commandments, the 10 commandments. And I actually learned something this week. Can't tell you how many times I've read Exodus. But I always felt like that Exodus 20 was after he'd been given the tables of stone. But it, Randy, he's already he's revealing what he's going to put on the tables of stone. And it's several chapters down the road that he actually says, come up to the mountain and I'm going to put this on stone for you. I said, so we're going to look through here. But I want you to see, and this is something where I'm starting. I wanted to start with something that was familiar to us all. And I have said, don't know where I got it. It was not original with me. That the person of God comes before the precepts and prohibitions. A lot of people want to tell us, Tyler, that uh, Old Testament saints were saved by their works, but we are saved by grace. But that would make God changeable. Right, And the Bible says that he is immutable, which is a $2 word that means he's changeless. He cannot change. Okay, the Bible says in, in uh, Hebrews 13 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's changeless. If he were to save somebody in the Old Testament by their works, Randy, and then refuse to save us by our works, that would make him unjust. Because the Bible says what? That God favors no man. There is no favor of persons with God. So he can't favor one man's work over another man's work. If we go back, the Bible says of Abraham that he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So he was saved by grace through faith. The Bible says, you can see this in Romans chapter 4, I believe. <clears throat> he talks about David. So even the Old Testament saints were saved by grace through faith. And we can see that when we go to the scriptures with that in mind, that God is changeless. Now he says in the New Testament we're saved by grace. And he says of a certain Old Testament, Testament personalities that they were saved by. If you think of King Saul, right? Uh, <clears throat> King Saul, what does the Bible say of King Saul? The Bible says that he, God gave him a new heart, okay? And so I believe, though he messed up late in life quite badly, I really believe we'll see Saul, as in King Saul, in heaven. Because God said he gave him a new heart. And I don't think that God's going to take away a new heart that he's given somebody, right? We can't lose our salvation. If you can, I can't find evidence of it in this book. At least evidence that I can, I can believe, all right? So in Exodus chapter 20, um, verse number 2, we'll just start with verse number 1. It says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. And herein we see a picture of salvation. He saved them from sin and he saved them from the world, okay? Uh, out of the land of Egypt, that's a picture of the world. And out of the house of bondage, we're in bondage to sin. And then we go through here and he gives us what we call the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, verse number four, thou shalt not make of thee any graven image. <clears throat> Verse number 7, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse number 8, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Verse number 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Uh, verse number 13, thou shalt not kill. 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. 15, thou shalt not steal. 16, thou shalt not bear false witness. 17, thou shalt not covet. And he goes on to name the neighbor's house, the neighbor's wife, the neighbor's servants, the neighbor's ox, his, you know, whatever. So if you look in 21, he's given us laws uh, 
for men servants, women servants, for murder and manslaughter and for stealers. And you look at um, verse 15, for instance, he that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Verse, uh, verse 16, he that stealeth a man and selleth him, if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Uh, he that curseth his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He shall pay for the loss of time, shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. That's if somebody's, uh, I guess read 18, and if a man strive together and smite one another with his fist, and he die, but he keepeth his bed, that he die not, but keepeth his bed, if he rise not and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he smote him be quit. Shall he that smote him be quit, or he shall be acquitted, we would say today. And he shall pay for the loss of time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So if we get in a fight with somebody and we hurt him, we gotta pay to get him healed. These are things that, that we teach and we know they came from scripture. But what I need us to see when we're looking at this is our works do not earn our place in heaven. Our works reveal, our actions, our deeds, our attitudes, our language reveals that we have a home in heaven, or it should. Okay, in 22, it's laws concerning theft and damage and trusts and trespasses and fornication and witchcraft and bestiality, um, idolatry, strangers and widows. Look at chapter 23. <clears throat> Here's some things that, that really jump out to me in chapter 23. Verse number one, thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thy hand to the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. So we shouldn't lie. Thou shalt not follow after a multitude to do evil. What do teenagers say to us often? Everybody else is doing it. Um, verse number four, I would say, is an Old Testament version of the golden rule. Uh, and it's going to say a word some of y'all might consider a curse word, but it's in the Bible, so I'm going to say what it says, okay? If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. So we don't, we don't see our neighbor's ox out and go, oh, look at there. Oh, oh, oh. He's going to lose that. I mean, no matter who that neighbor is, right? What did Charles tell us? And I think Christ told us that with the story of the Samaritan. Our neighbor is not necessarily the person that lives across the street. It's any man. I, I wasted, in my estimation, Miss Janice, probably an hour and a half the other day because I came down the road in another part of the state and I saw somebody's 200-pound calf right there on the side of the road. And I'm like, if that calf gets in the road, somebody's going to get hurt and somebody's going to lose their investment. So I went to three or four houses. Nobody answered the door. Spent 10 minutes on hold with the state troopers. They never came back. Called the county. They called me to call the state troopers. I finally just drove up to the state trooper's office and gave him the mile marker where the dude was at. And he's like, oh, that's, that's Charles's calves. I'll get, it, I'll get it taken care of. You know, whatever. It wasn't Charles's, but I can't remember the name. He knew it. But that is the Old Testament version of the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them to do unto thee. Look in verse 7. Keep thee far from a false matter. Keep, stay away from it, okay? I think sometimes we forget it. He talks about unleavened bread, the three feasts. But look... <clears throat> In verse 22, let's start in verse 20. Behold, I send an angel. But in your Bible, what is special about that word angel? It's capitalized, okay? So, and he's going to change his terminology in a verse or two. So, behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. And obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries for mine angel. Or in today's language, my angel. This is clearly a reference to Christ because it's capitalized here. Shall go before thee and bring thee into the land of excuse me, unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. So there's six tribes where I'm sending you, but I'm going to take care of you. You're not going to bow down and serve any of their gods. Verse 24, you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. And I will take sickness, so y'all going to be healthy. You're going to have plenty to eat. And there shall nothing cast their young, so we're not going to have any miscarriages. I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will send hornets before thee, verse 28, which shall drive out the Hivite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before thee. And I will drive them out 
I will not drive them out before the end of one year, lest the land become desolate. So even in taking care of their enemies, he's going to do it in a timeline so that he can take care of his people. Okay, I am the Lord, your God. I'm, a, I'm your God. You're my people. Okay, that's the idea here. And even in chastening the evil to bring blessing upon the good, he's going to do it slowly so that they don't have to clean up all the briars where the land has lain desolate for a year or two. Again, verse 32, uh, verse 31, he gives them their, their borders, which are basically from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. Uh, 32, you're not going to make any covenants with them. 33, they shall not dwell in the land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods... It will surely be a snare unto you. Look at chapter 24. Uh, Moses is called up to the mountains here, okay? And uh, this is where he goes up and, and gets the, the stones. Look here. Look in verse 3. This is very important, I think. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we Will we do? So God's given them these three, four chapters now of law, and they said, we're going to do it all. We're going to do all of that, okay? But <clears throat> let's go to verse, here that he goes up there. Go to chapter 25. The Lord starts talking about what they need to bring for the tabernacle. Notices in verse 2, he's talking about every man with a willing heart. Okay, uh, in verse in chapter 26, he begins to uh, talk about the curtains of the tabernacle, uh, the, the how it's going to be made, the veil before the ark, the hanging for the door, and look in verse 27, in chapter 27, and verse 16. Okay, <clears throat> not mentioned some of this in the devotional before church this morning, and the gate of the court shall be in hanging 20 cubits of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine twine linen, linen wrought with needlework. And their pillars shall be four and their sockets four. But what you have here with the tabernacle is you've got this great white wall. As I understand it, it was more than 10 feet tall. And it's its own boards that are in sockets of silver, which is the price of redemption. And we can get all of that. But basically you got a white wall all the way around the tabernacle. And God says he's going to put the tabernacle in the middle of the people. So you're going to have four tribes here and four tribes here and four tribes there and four tribes there. And the Levites are going to take care of this tabernacle. There's only one door to the tabernacle, Randy. Just one door. There's a big white wall all the way around it. And so what we see is by man's power, we can't get into fellowship with God by doing something good. We've got to come through the door. And again, it's, it's purple. It's red, it's white, it's blue. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just like I told you in the devotion this morning, the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the sacrificial servant, the perfect son of man, and the heavenly origins of salvation. You see that. You go right to the, the altar, which is where we pay for our sins. At that point, the shedding of the blood of bullocks and rams and all of that was kind of like a credit card. Jesus is going to pay the final price on the cross. Then there's the laver, okay? Um, <clears throat> we see that the... the, the uh, Look, if we get to the laver in a minute. Look in chapter 28, verse number 6. We see they shall make the ephod, I think is how you pronounce it, which is like the vest that the preacher wore of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine linen. Basically, this is showing that the, the priests are representing Christ. But what are you? The Bible says in Peter that we're a nation of priests. If we're believers, we are priests. Okay? If you look in chapter 29, in verse number uh, 14, we see the sin offering. In verse number 18, we see the burnt offering. In verse number 22, we see the, the consecration offering. In verse number 28, we see the peace offering. <clears throat> so we see basically salvation, sanctification, and complete satisfaction in Christ. And we're going to read some scriptures. I've asked some people to read some scriptures, and I've kind of forgotten who I asked to read what. So when I tell you to read it, then you can tell me who that is. And I think I've left a verse out. Uh, I think I asked you to read Revelations 8, 3, and 4, right? 
Okay, so I'm going to read a couple of verses here, and then I want you to read those verses there. And thou shalt make an altar. This is chapter 30. Thou shalt make an offer to burn incense of shittim wood, and thou shalt make it. A cubic shall be the length thereof, and a cubic the breadth thereof. And so he's talking about the height of it, but we've got incense, and he's talking about what it's made of. And if you read all the way somewhere in here, it says if anybody... Uh, Verse 38, if anybody makes, this is Hallman's paraphrase of verse number 38, if anybody makes an incense that smells like this one, he's going to be cut off from the people. Now, Michael, I don't know if that means he's going to be killed or just exiled, but we know God doesn't want you to have this incense. There's this altar of incense there in the tabernacle. Read Revelations 8, 3, and 4, please. So this is representative. This incense going up in the tabernacle is representative of our prayers going up. Look, and I may skip some things here um, for the sake of time, but look in verse number 18. Thou shalt make a laver of brass. Okay, so we're talking about a sink here. His foot also of brass to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle and the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. <clears throat> and Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and feet there. Now, what do you do at the altar that would make you need to wash before you go to the inner tabernacle? What takes place at the altar? Come on, this is a flow question. I'm going to walk up there, and I'm going to take a knife, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to slit the throat. I'm going to slaughter an animal, whether it be a sheep or whether I'm a poor person and it's two birds. I'm going to slaughter this animal. I'm going to have blood. Blood's going to get on my feet. Before I go in there to talk to God, I'm going to wash my feet and I'm going to wash my hands. Uh, Michael, I don't think I called on anybody to send a text to read this one, but would you read 1 John 1, 9? 1 John 1, 9. I think you'll see it's very similar. While he's looking that up, remember to when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Peter stood up loud mouth. You ain't washing my feet. It's bad grammar. That's something like he said if he were from Mississippi, right? You're not going to wash my feet. And he said, if I don't wash your feet, I have nothing to do with you. And he said, hmm, just wash me all over then. He said, you don't have need to wash all over. You're already saved, Hallman's paraphrase. You just need to wash your hands and your feet. That is the laver for us. Confession, forsaking that sin, giving it to God. That's washing our hands and feet. Now, <clears throat> there's the candlestick in there. there. There are several things in there, okay? But uh, in verse chapter 31, I've preached from this, so I'm not going to I'm not going to get deep into to chapter 31, but he clearly says that he called uh, Bezalel and Aholiab to work with their hands to build these things that he required for the the tabernacle there. There's the candlestick. Jesus is the light of the world. There's only one door. He said, I am the door. I mean, we see Christ in all of that. And he wants to be in the middle of them, just like he wants to be in the middle of us. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> look in chapter 32, which we're not going to read the whole chapter, but... Verse number one, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up, now who brought him out? The Lord said earlier, I brought you out. But now they're attributing the work of God to Moses. Moses brought us up out. Hmm. He brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We wot not what is before, what has become of him. He's been up there too long. He's been up there about 40 days. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings. Now he tells uh, Moses later that they forced him to. And that he just threw this gold in the fire and the, and the calf popped out. I mean, that's like a lie a three-year-old would tell, right? She did it. Even though you know she's still sucking a bottle, she couldn't have done it. All right? They've attributed the work of God. 
Now here's my questions, and then I'm going to try to get into chapter 33. What makes heaven heaven? And I want you to answer it to the best of your ability. What makes heaven heaven? If you, I mean, We could talk about a lot of things. There's a lot of grand things in heaven. The Bible teaches that we'll be known. I believe we're going to be known by those who have gone on before us, and we're going to know them when we get there. There's no night in heaven. So to us, it's been a long time since my daddy died or since my papa died or since one of my aunts or uncles died or since my buddies in college died or whatever. But it's going, it, to us, it's been a long time. To them, it's been just a little while. I mean, that's an amazing thing. Uh, we can talk about the, the crystal sea and the tree of life and all these different things. But if you had to nail it down to one thing, what makes heaven heaven? Thank you, Brother Jerry. His presence. Brother Charles, would you read the six verses I asked you to read? No, no, no. I ask you to read John 14, 1 to 6. That Psalm 135 was to everybody. So I, you know me, you Amen. So I get from that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to heaven but by him. But it seems to me that what makes heaven heaven is the presence of Christ. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes, he's going to prepare a place that where I am, there you may be also. So what makes heaven heaven, the, the gist of it all, all that other stuff is just a fruit of him being there. But what makes heaven heaven is we'll be with Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when he talks about the rapture, he said, comfort your hearts. And the end of that little section says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. What makes heaven heaven is Christ is there. Now what makes this life worth living? You tell me. What makes this? If you had to nail it down, we could talk about family. We could talk about our children. We could talk about some of us. could talk about our grandchildren. We could talk about our spouses. We could talk about our parents. We could talk about serving the country. There's so many things we could talk about it. But if we had to nail it down to one thing, what makes life worth living? Would you read the two verses I asked you to read, Brother Chris? Matthew 28, the last part of the last verse. In Hebrews 13, 5, I believe. I will never leave thee or forsake thee. I will never leave thee. No. So shouldn't there be a relationship in our own lives, something that we see and feel like I've been trying to say today about what makes heaven heaven and what makes life life? Should be Christ, right? Now look here. Chapter 32, what happened? You tell me. I just told you about it. Moses is up on the mountain 40 days. What did the people do while he was gone? They created an idol to worship. And it, it, as I read, the Bible is not explicit in this matter, but as I read, it's just like any other idol worship. You'll find with idol worship, it typically includes drugs, it typ whether that drug be alcohol or something else. It typically includes some kind of drug, and it typically includes some kind of illicit sex. And that's what was going on down there. Okay, so what's God's response to it? He said, I'm going to be in your midst. I'm going to be your Lord. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be in the middle of you. I'm going to send my angel among you. That's special, right? I'm going to give you the land. I'm, I'm going to give you the land. So you, and it's going to flow with milk and honey. So you're not only going to have a place to live, you're going to have economic affluence. 
I, I'm going to drive out the, the Amorites and the Hivites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Termites and the Mosquito Bites and all these things. I'm going to drive out before you with hornets and I'm going to do it slowly so the land doesn't waste away while I'm doing it. So you're going to have military might. Economic affluence and my presence is going to be with you. Sounds pretty good. But look at what, look at what the deal God makes with them now. Look in chapter 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt. Notice, it's no longer my people, it's the people. It's not the people that I brought up out, but it's the people that thou hast brought up out. Okay, so they gave the works of God to a man, and God then says, okay, if that's the way you want it, that's the way it is, okay? Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. God says, hey, I said I was going to do it. I'm still going to do it, all right? I will send, but notice this angel. I will send an angel. What's the difference there? Two differences. What's the difference? It's not capitalized, and it's not specific. It's just any old angel, okay? <clears throat> Before thee. Now, I will drive out the Canaanite. He's already told him he'd do that. He's still going to drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, I think it's supposed to be the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So they're still going to have military might. They're still going to have economic affluence. For I will not, uh oh, for I will not up, go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now, think about that. Before we get to the next verse, think about that. God says, I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you economic affluence. I'm going to give you military might or security. I'm going to give you some religiosity. You're going to have an angel amongst you. Doesn't that sound like a lot of church today? I'm not saying it sounds like Bethlehem, but I'm saying according to the scripture, we need to look into the mirror of God's word and see if that talks about us. But I know it talks about modern Christianity. We are... We are defined by a, not we at Bethlehem necessarily, but modern Christianity is defined by biblical illiteracy. We don't know what the Bible says. And practical impotency. We're not seeing lives changed around us like, like once was. We've got Jesus close there, but we don't have him enough that he affects our daily walk and talk, do we? Speaking nationally, not necessarily personally to us, but again, we've got to make this personal. What would we say if the Lord said to me, John, I'm going to make you a famous preacher and you're going to write books and they're going to be bestsellers and everybody's going to want to have you come speak and, and I'm going to give you security and I'm going to give you economic influence, but I'm not going with you. What would be my response? What would be your response? I can tell you what our response should be and I feel like it's what's preventing us from a revival. Look at the next word. Most people, I think, would say, I'm good, I'm good. If I got military might, I got security, I got economic affluence, I've got some religion, I'll be set. When the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. And no man did put on his ornaments, his jewelry, his trappings, okay? For the Lord said unto Moses, say unto the children, say unto the children of Israel, ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. Let me, let me think about this a minute, basically. Chapter, uh, verse number 6, And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Oreb, and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. But now he just said a few chapters before it's going to be in the middle of camp, but now God's got it outside the camp. Okay? He called it the tabernacle of the congregation. It came to pass that every one sought the Lord that which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle, which was without the camp. So he's near, but we don't have to go out there. And it came to pass that when Moses went into the tabernacle, all the people arose. So here's this respect and reverence that they have, but they're in their tents. They're not going out there as a group. And it came to pass Moses entered into the tabernacle 
The cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar uh, at the uh, stand at the door of the tabernacle, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man at his tent. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, Thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people? And thou hast not let me know whom thou wast in with me? Is this any old angel? Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. We talked about this in the Sunday school. That what, what does it mean to us that God knows us by name? And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. I don't care about all this other stuff, Lord. I want to know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. And he, the Lord, said, My presence shall go with thee. I will give thee rest. He said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For therein, wherein, shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not if thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight. And I know thee by name. He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God shows him his glory. Look, there's two things I want you to take away from this. First off, they messed up, but they didn't lose their salvation. God still said, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. You're my people. I said I was going to give you this land. I'm going to give you this land. So in his grace, though he was going to remove his felt and sustained presence from them, he was not going to take away the blessings he had promised to them and to their fathers and grandfathers and so forth. That's, that's a good thing, I think. So it really helps me, Chris, because sometimes when I see people, whether they be part of Bethlehem or part of some other church, that aren't living right, my first thought is they're lost. And this, to me, clearly teaches that they can be saved and just so far away from God, they don't know what to do to get back. But God and his grace will bring them back. It's just like Brother Mark told, help me, Lord. Like Brother Mark told Tyler, when you go to basic and when you're in the Marine Corps, you're going to be tempted to depart your faith. But if you're saved, God's going to bring you back to it. That, that's comforting to me. But what I want us to take away from this is are we willing to say, Lord, you can have all of that mess if I just have your presence and I feel your presence in my life daily and I know I'm being used of you daily. That's what Moses said. We want to show your glory to all the world. And the way we do that is to see you in our lives every day. That's revival. It changes our, our, our vertical attitude and it changes our horizontal attitude. It changes my attitude of worship towards my Redeemer. This place becomes important. This place becomes more important than anything else because this is where we gather as an assembly to worship God. And if I'm where I'm supposed to be with God, this place is going to take preeminence over anything else in my life. And that is going to make me be the witness that I should be when I'm in the street. Not just verbally, but in my actions. Now, I know there are some great witnesses here. But I think not just Bethlehem, but our community, our county, our country has to come back to a place where the felt and sustained presence of Christ is more important than anything else in our lives. And the problem that I have, Chris, is I'm always waiting on somebody else to get right with God. Maybe it's me. Maybe it needs to start with John. Maybe we're waiting at the high school for somebody else to get right, Michael. Maybe it's got to start with Michael. Maybe it's got to start with Jake in the band. We need to examine ourselves and to see if the most important thing in our life is our relationship with Christ. Because when we choose something else, He's going to let us.
They attributed the works of God to Abraham, and God attributed the works of God to Abraham. We seem to be, nationally speaking, maybe not so much here, I hope not, but we seem to be building the work of God on personalities and programs. But it's got to be built upon our relationship with Christ. Pray for your preacher. I'm serious. Because I know there were points in my life that I felt closer to the Lord than I feel today. And I think if we're honest, that's probably true for every one of us that's saved. In fact, there are people that are part of the church that have talked to me and said, hey, I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I'm not ready to get where I'm supposed to be. Well, ask God to help you get ready to get where you're supposed to be. Because he didn't grab you by the ear and make you get saved, and he ain't going to grab you by the ear and make you walk and talk and, and, and have your life centered around him. It's just like, I'm going to try to say this and shut up because I've preached too long now. But speaking to you single guys for a second, from Jake to Michael and all y'all back in there, would you want to go out with a girl that you had to coerce to go out with you? And the fact is, none of us want a relationship based on coercion. Coercion means you forced her to go out with you. You had to pay her, or you had to talk her into it, or you had to get somebody else to twist her arm to go out with you. You don't want to go. You don't. You don't want to be associated in a relationship like that. You want a mutual, loving relationship. You want that girl to think as much of you as you do of her. That's what marriages are built upon. Okay. I thanked my wife this morning for loving a fat old preacher. It, it, it takes two. The Lord is standing there, and he's saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But we just keep carrying our own burdens when he's standing right there where he's always been waiting to carry the burdens for us. When are we going to come to Christ? You say, I'm already saved. Hey, amen. I'm glad. But there's a difference in being saved and feeling his presence daily. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege.